Many of you will know my next guest on In The Game as the former frontman of the band called Dishwalla from the 1990s to the early 2000s. He is producing albums and he has a great solo career. I am talking about J.R. Richards. J.R., you are in the game. I appreciate you jumping on. How are things? You're in the UK, are you? I am, yeah. I am uh, just a little bit south of Oxford. So what? what's the, uh, is that recording there or is that just stuck there? <laughs> <What>? <laughs> no, my wife and I moved here. Uh, my wife's British, so we moved here about almost, well, about four years now. Okay, I didn't know that. I didn't know that. That's one thing I didn't know about you. So they don't, they don't talk about that in the tabloids or in your uh, bio online and anything but anyways yeah um glad to hook up with you it's funny i was talking to brian vander ark on the show uh i think it was friday or thursday uh you you happened to email me back we were in a conversation about artists and certain artists and i just mentioned your name and he said well say hello to jr he's a he was a good soul we had a good relationship through the years when we were you know out on the road so uh, it was it was kind of cool to 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 see that so um so yeah i just i yeah so i just wanted to start off i guess uh you've got some new stuff that's coming out apparently uh or or it's scheduled to be released is my understanding it's kind of a tough situation in year for that to happen for whether it's for artists or, or for anybody in business in general um what are you currently up to and, and what are you doing well yeah i mean i am working on another solo album um it would be my fourth solo album i guess so yeah my fourth or fifth and um, yeah, but I've, I've unfortunately had to put things kind of on hold just because of the current health crisis. So um, because I'm in the UK and my band that I play with is in Los Angeles and, and uh, that's where we were going to be recording last month. So that's, that's been put on hold. Have you, um, have, you guys, have you guys been able to maybe like this kind of... I know how bands are uh, playing through Zoom or through online. Have you been able to kind of rehearse that way or, or do some things that way or no? <laughs> not, not really. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's an odd way yeah. it, you know, because of the delay. There is a delay, so you can't actually truly perform in real time with one another. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, a bit, it's a bit awkward. I mean, I, the way that I do it is I, we share a lot of files and I'll demo things up and we'll work on things and shoot things back and forth. But um, typically we get so much done so fast when we're in the same room together that it's, uh, you know, I'll probably be waiting till I can do that. <laughs> now, it can be a hinder, but can it be a blessing too? Meaning, are you getting some creativity with some downtime or I don't want to say alone time, but it's either going to hurt some artists or it's going to really help some artists. Are, are you being able to take advantage of the situation or not really? No, absolutely. I mean, you know, you have to definitely. I mean, I've always, you know, being an artist, I've always had to think outside of the box, you know, desperately not wanting to have a real job and try to figure out how to continue to do this uh, music thing. So um, yeah, I mean, I've been doing all kinds of things. I, it turns out I've been producing quite a few artists and uh, doing a lot of co-writes on songwriting and, and um, as well as working on my own thing. So I've, I've you know, because I was actually supposed to be on tour this year too. I was supposed to be in Asia and down in, you know, uh, Australia and New Zealand. And, and uh, um, I even had to cancel the U.S. or postpone that until next year. So um, yeah, I've had to, had to, have had to be creative, but I've been as busy as I, you know, have ever been surprisingly. Yeah. 
A lot, a lot of people, I mean, if they're familiar with you, uh, I mean, most people, I mean, I was familiar with you from about 95, 96 with Dishwalla. Uh, I mean, obviously, you know, we were, you know, from Ontario, Canada, we were skateboarding, we were listening to your, your music. Um, but a lot of people don't realize, uh, you know, you fast forward through the 2000s um, that you, you were involved with either movies or TV shows, you produced, uh, like, People don't realize that if you bring your name up or mention Dishwalla, yeah, 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 yeah. But they don't really realize how outside the box you are. You're not just a musician. And, and not only that, when people listen to your music, if it is, if it was Dishwalla or your solo stuff, which I'll talk about later, um, people don't realize your true background when you started, like you studied theory or you did jazz, like a bunch of stuff from a young age, right? Like you are, did you come from a very musical family? Uh, yeah, I, I did. My, my grandfather was a songwriter and he was also an Olympic diver. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you know, my father was a songwriter too, although he, he also had, you know, he went to, um, Stanford and was a mathematician as well, but um, so but I was surrounded by music quite a bit. So uh, yeah, I mean I, I studied jazz and classical since I was five, and um, I've studied bel canto opera technique for about almost thirty years now. So yeah, yeah, I've, yeah, spent I've been yeah, a that, major, you know. It, it, it's funny because, like I said, the more I'm finding it, and, and like I said, the conversation I had last week with Brian Vanderark, it was the same thing. He come from almost like um, his parents were like church soloists, or do right. It came from an extensive background, right? Um, and and we discuss kind of my feeling on music that it not not saying with your current stuff or his current stuff, but the '90s was an amazing decade of music. And, you know, his influences uh, came from, you know, some of the 70s, some of the 60s. And we talked about how the kids today don't have the same influences we have, and they probably should, whether it's, you know, Elvis, Buddy Holly, um, you know, Chuck Berry, like understanding how music transitioned. And like I said, the 90s from about 91 to like 98 was an amazing block of time for music right and and yeah. you were involved in that block of music and you know the stuff i see today i i don't feel it right and then i look at you and i look at brian and i look at a few other uh i have christopher thorne coming up from blind melon your music has evolved it's evolved i believe that your composition um skills as an artist has really improved because it's not it's not like your three piece or four piece punk or grunge band. It's you're involving pianos, you're involved, involving all sorts of instruments. Your songwriting abilities have really improved. Uh, and, and I think that's with maturity, right? Like, I mean, you, 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 your influences change over the years. So you change as a person, but also I would assume things in your life has made you change from where you were 20 years ago with your songwriting, right? Oh yeah, I mean that's that's a huge impact on what you're writing about. I mean the fact that I'm here in the UK and I'm an American, I and mean, we came here because one of our boys was extremely ill, and but being a dual citizen, he had the ability to come and and be in this uh, healthcare system that was much better. I mean the one in the states, as good as it can be, um, it was uh, bankrupting us. So. Um, you know, we had, we had to do something drastic, <laughs> Yeah, yeah. but yeah, I mean, that's, and that's, you know, I've written songs about it. I mean, that's, that's a big, a big, huge influence in my life in terms of what winds up being in songs. How, you know, going out on your own, um, after, like, I, I don't know all the dynamics of the situation or if it was just mutual or everything, you know, I don't even really want to get into the, the topic of, uh, um, with this swallow, but going from the band to your own, um, was it one of the hardest things that you had to do to get to uh, where you needed to be, feeling comfortable on your own, or was it a, just a natural progression? You were fine with the transition and you were happier. Like I think, it, I think that's a good question. I think it's it was a natural progression. I think, albeit a painful one. You know, um, it's not not an easy one, just because you know when you've been in. in doing something with a certain group of people for a long period of time. I mean, you're, you're definitely emotionally connected in, in various ways. Um, and then there's also, I think that, that 
you know, sense of going and doing my own thing too. Is it going to be compared to what I've done with the Schwala? Is it, you know, going to be as successful or is it, you know, but, so, but is, is it about, is it about success or like, I mean, don't get me wrong. You, you want to have the royalties to be able to keep living and, and, and the success, but yeah. was it more about creative freedom? Like, um, being able to be in control of what you're creating. Uh, you know, I think that's a big part of it. I, I think that earlier on, there's, you know, when we were younger and in our early 20s, you know, there's a, there's a different emotional aspect. You know, you, you don't have as much responsibility and it's, it's much more of a carefree environment. So I think, you know, anything can go and be okay. And as we kind of evolved, and I, you know, being this, the main songwriter too, it's, you, you know, you're always having to... <laughs> You know, if you, you come in with an idea, it's it, it's always having to sh to uh, give up a lot of what you maybe see or heard and stuff, and you're you're constantly being, uh, you know, it's like I don't know, it's like being a politician in a lot of degrees when you're songwriting with other people sometimes because you're trying to keep Club, everybody happy and work together and yeah, and not work. compromise the song and the way that you see it. So, um, I think you know by after about 15 years of that, I was excited with the prospect of being able to go and do that without having to always concern myself with, with keeping everybody happy. You know, I just focus on doing it myself. And so how, how much has, how much has, uh, I mean, how, how many, you have uh, one or two kids or how many kids you have? So, so how much has being a dad and having a family, affected you like another artist that i was looking at um who had an impact on my life was art uh, lexicus and yeah. uh, i see his posts he's battling ms and i saw some things with his fa with his family and yeah. man when you when you instagram was not there in the 2000 in the 90s or facebook so we didn't have that so so right. a person related to you uh, on mtv or record sales or in concert but now you're slowly starting to see a personal side of artists. So I know you're pri like most artists are still private with their family, but how has the family aspect of it changed your life as a person and as an artist moving forward? Um, yeah, I mean, that's, that's a good question. Um, well, it's interesting, you know, cause it, yeah, like I was saying before with growing up, and being in a band and having no responsibility to now having, you know, being a parent and a husband and having a tremendous amount of, of, of responsibility hugely changes how you look at things. So, and, I, and it's interesting because you, you, you pulled out that point. I was worried about success and I guess it's not really success. I, I mean, I want to write great songs as what I was thinking about as I left that hopefully they'll, you know, cause you worry about people comparing. But I do think in terms of successful enough to be able to pay the bills and yeah. take care of children and stuff like that. So, um, you know, and, 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 and a big part of it is when I'm how I'm scheduling myself too. you know, so I, I, it's, it's, you know, when I go out on tour, I go, I usually don't go for more than a month at, at a time instead of going out at six months at a time or a year at a time. So, um, you know, so that, that changes things as well. It's, it's funny how you brought up, a month at a time or the touring um you know my biggest thing is over the years you know we, we we've lost i mean you can go even way back but you know we've lost kurt cobain we lost shannon hoon we lost we lost a lot of artists um and, and again um via drugs it could have been or mental illness or but 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 the talk of mental illness uh with a lot of people in general today is coming up you have to think that you know, when people are suffering from that, it's, it's either genetics or it's either uh, pressure or underlying issues. Touring, um, like you said, one month at a time, when I he just heard that, I was like, wow, you know, like, n I haven't heard that before because normally it's a three, four, five, six month time. Yeah. If you've got family, if you've got kids, if, and they're not with you or you're wanting to keep them privatized in their own house with mom or, or a partner, uh, mm -hmm. it's one of those things where, is it still a concern or is it a, as large of a problem in the music industry with um, people having those issues still? Or, you know, is that just a, a label that, you know, being a rock star comes with the drinking, you know, you know what I mean, right? I, 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 do artists communicate like what people are starting to do in public now where they say it's okay if someone, if you're struggling, 
you know, contact me or contact, you know, is that prevalent? Is it out there? Um, it is. Sorry, I've got the, the window guy ringing hey. my doorbell right now. No, that's fine. Yeah. <laughs> um, Are you okay if I go grab it real quick? Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Sorry, my man. Yeah, yeah I, know. I just realized yeah. nobody's here. I'll be, I'll be right back. Uh, yeah. Sorry, Chris. Hey, man, that's not a problem. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, jump me back in. What, what were we just talking like, about? Like, is the, the issue, like you said, when you were touring, like you tried to do a month at a time, and, and I brought up, you know, the loss of some artists with probably pressure, drugs, and, and, and maybe mental illness, and now the mental illness is becoming more it's it's uh evident with just everyday people um yeah. and and the stress and pressures of you guys to pay the bills with your body your image your music it's it's not an easy gig and you rely on you know the 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 uh royalties the fans the touring i mean that's hard and are artists communicating amongst each other a little more these days uh, or or friends are they a little more open about that because you know we always hear about oh you know when it happens rest in peace will be met like you hear the artists lining up with hashtags when it's too late like are we right. are they yeah. opening up and communicating more or no i think there's certainly more awareness now um and i think that artists in general too are being um, are, are opening up and giving more access to a lot of the people around them too, which is probably yeah. healthy for hey, conversation you know, and dialogue and yeah. in general, right? I mean, so, you know, because then people are paying attention. I mean, that's a big, a big part of it. I mean, you look at a lot of the guys and gals that we've lost and they've typically it's, you know, when they are gone, people are like, gosh, I had no idea or, you know, because they were, you know, often people just kind of withdraw and they aren't, you know, really reaching out to anybody. So, you know, it's amazing how one conversation can change, you know, the course of somebody doing something. Yeah, you know, I, I mean, that's whatever it might be. That's why, you know, one of the reasons why, I mean, with myself, I mean, I'm on episode 16 of this, uh, like, show or podcast and episodes. And, and oh. it's only because my agency with the pandemic like yourself has slowed down with the professional athletes right. you know we're talking to pro athletes we're talking to musicians talking to cultural influencers and the biggest right. reason is is i'm kind of going down my playlist for my musicians when i my whole life and you're you're on there right so oh, awesome. but the other part like i told brian on thursday was I want to be able to take, you know, if there's a Patreon page or if there's a Spotify and make sure the artist is being pumped because right now, right, right. now things are a little tougher because oh, yeah. it's until the venues open up. I mean, royalties or plays or hits or likes is yeah. keeping them aware that, you know, these people who sometimes you look at them as being uh, superhuman, like, I mean, some do, like with rock stars or, or musicians. And right. now all of a sudden it's like, you know what? You lost your job at the local mill. You know, this guy here who's a lead singer, like we're all, we're all people and we're all together now. And, and the conversation we're having, something that you say may spark something to a listener to keep them going or to say, hey, it's not just me. So, you know, I, J.R. Richards, who I knew as, you know, is, is also in the same boat with not being able to perform, not being able to connect with his fans. And, and to me, that's why we did this and started this. And it's been pretty good. Um, and, and also it's to, to touch base with uh, what you're doing now, right? So I want to make sure that people are aware that you are coming out with some new material. Um, it's just been a little tough and, and a little slow with what's going on. Yeah. So, um, from now or from this point now, how much has the industry changed in general for you? How have things changed from when you came out? It was Napster, or it was you know like I, like I mean Napster was not mid nineties. Then you have you know all the Spotify, Apple. How much has the industry changed? Are you doing stuff mainly on your own now? Meaning, I know when I spoke to Wright said Fred, who they're from the UK as well. They're mainly self-produced. They're mainly self-sufficient, and they rely on you know the the word of mouth. Uh, they're promoting themselves. Are you more like that now, where it takes a lot of that effort? 
Yeah, absolutely. You know, I am, I am my own label. I mean, I'm truly an independent artist these days. So, um, uh, I am my own infrastructure. <laughs> but, but it's, it's good, right? Because yeah. we discuss, yeah. we discussed, um, you, again, your creativity or you're not going to say that you're going to, you know, some artists, I appreciate their feelings. Uh, sometimes when they're speaking, they give their point of views. It's, it's, it can be overboard in a concert, but being independent does allow you to have the freedom to do or say, or, or produce what you want because you don't have the pressure of the record label saying right. this is what we need. Correct. Or, yeah. Yeah. And you're, you're not also, you know, your record sales are not supporting some massive corporation to stay afloat. So, um, you know, as soon as I started doing my own albums, I, for the first time in my life, I actually own my own record. You know, it's mine. It's my physical that's your, master. Your catalog, right? Like that's, uh, yeah, that's I your mean, full. Yeah. And I actually, you know, I own the physical recordings of it. I mean, cause I look back at, you know, Dish Holidays, that first album when we did sold millions of copies, I've never seen a dime from selling any of those from, from any, any of those record sales. I mean, yeah, you make money in publishing here or there and in performance royalties for being on the radio, but for actual sales of, of albums, I've never seen anything and I probably never will. So, um, which is crazy because you can sell a couple million albums and break even. And nowadays you can sell 50,000 albums and buy a house, you yeah. know, if, because of how much things have changed to answer your question, it's changed dramatically. So are the artists that are still under labels, do you think they're getting ripped? Like meaning Spotify, like, like <laughs> what, I, what I'm saying is the deals, there would have been deals set up with Spotify and all these streaming yeah. services. So artists still would probably have to get a royalty, but just like anything else, the person that owns that is probably getting a larger chunk, right? Like it's probably still not a fair, a real fair deal or has well, it gotten yeah, better? I, I, I think, well, it's interesting because I think in terms of album, album sales, you know, um, like if you sell something on iTunes and like me for myself, instead of, so say, say you sell a song on iTunes and it's, and it's a dollar that somebody pays for it. So iTunes is gonna take 15 cents of that right off the bat. And then you might have the distribution service take another 10 cents off of that, okay? So that's 25 cents is gone. So you take home 75 cents, okay, for that download, which is amazingly better than what it was before yeah. because normally what you would do is if somebody paid a dollar for every dollar that you would make back in the day, the album would, the record company would take 90 cents of that right off the top. Yeah. And they would say, all right, there's 10 cents to split between the artists. And if there's five of you, so you each are getting two cents. But then the label's saying, but you also owe us money. So you're going to pay us back by giving us that 10 cents. So they take the whole dollar. Um, and, then, and then they're also the ones that decide when you've paid them back, when you've recouped. But, I mean, there's no check or balance on that. So they basically just... You know, we, they still say that we've never paid them back fully. So they're still taking everything from us. So, so yeah. that's crazy. So the difference now is, uh, you know, I'll make 75 cents on, on, on a song when, before I make nothing. So, so it's, for you, it's gotten a, a heck of a lot better, yeah. right? Okay. That's, Definitely. That's, streaming wise, not so much because streaming is now the new thing that's really is going to take over where people are just, you know, watching things and streaming it, at, you know, in real time and you know, the way that it's been set up and Spotify really does kind of control that. I mean, there are other streaming services. They, they pay horribly. And there's been a massive battle trying to get them to pay something that is yeah. fair. Um, but, you know, they're, they make billions of dollars off of artists. Is, is, is the illegal downloading still an issue? I mean, I know I've seen people, I've, I know I've seen people go into YouTube, copy a link of a video, could, let's just say uh, one of your songs, June, uh, June Becomes July. Uh, they, they would go into a video, copy the link, then go into a YouTube to MP3 and then make it an MP3 and then they have your song on a thing. That to me is illegal still. I mean, you're, yeah. I mean, the artist is losing there, right? And I mean, yeah. how, how do we combat that? Is there a way around that? Is there a way, I mean, is there, there's gotta be a way to encrypt stuff on YouTube. Like, is, I mean, that person, if you're uploading something to YouTube should still have to protect your property cause from being copied, pasted on a link, correct? Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, 
it, the problem is, is that it's, I mean, you can, you can open up, I could open up YouTube right now and, and I, you know, I have a recording studio I'm in here. So I just, I just take my two outputs that I would normally be listening through speakers to appreciate what it was. Yeah. And I can actually record right into yeah. a, a digital audio workstation and record it. And, and boom, I own that file now. Yeah. And then I can share that with the world in, in whatever form or fashion. So there's no real way to protect that. Um, yeah. There are some things that they, they can do to make it harder for people, but if somebody really wants to, to steal it, they can. Yeah, that's the that's the unfortunate part. It's funny. I up I uploaded I uploaded Brian's episode on Monday, and yeah. he actually he actually busted out the acoustic and played the freshman. And within yeah. a minute of it being uploaded to YouTube, it was like copyright infringement. Boom, 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 boom. Right. right, and I, right. Yeah. It kind of Brian Brian just laughed and said, "It's just some like fifty something year old gray haired dude just singing a, co a cover of freshman." He's like, and he goes, uh, he goes, just fill it out that the owner give you permission." I just kind of laughed and chuckled, and I said, in, in a way, it was good. They were right on. It, but the reality right. the reality is artists are still losing a ton right and and right. that's that's the unfortunate part so i want to talk about some of your newer music with your um um the last like the previous albums uh, i listened to first of all i want to thank you for um the attempt to bring back real music videos <laughs> okay okay because yeah. because music videos were awesome um, before Big Brother and all this garbage reality TV came into MTV. I don't know what happened there, but music videos always told a story. And, you know, when I, over the last year or two, when I bumped in some of your videos, I'm like, a few of them or most of them were telling stories. They were yeah. back, back to the way music videos should be. Now, granted, one, it's probably not cheap for you being – uh, self-funded meaning you've got to create all that it, it I mean even if you've got buddies at film uh, if you don't you're paying for it uh, yeah. and, and it's got to be worthwhile for you but some of the videos I saw like I said they're telling stories your lyrics are telling stories um, you're getting back to actual creative writing in my opinion where I don't see a lot of that on today's in today's yeah. music. Yeah. is your writing I want to ask you because I listened to a few songs. Is there regrets in your life or were there things that happened looking back 20 or 30 years ago that's reflecting on your current music now? And I'm just asking you that based on some of the songs that you penned. Um, yeah, definitely. I mean, I guess typically how I deal with things that, you know, don't might be difficult, you know, challenges, those kind of things tend to tend to show up in the songs. So, I mean, if life were always easy, I probably wouldn't have much to write about. Yeah, June Becomes July was one that hit me. Mm -hmm. um, just lyrics about, when I, mean, I just bring up, I saw, you know, dad and or uh, the regrets like the, the yeah, it's, you know what, it's, it strikes me as a chord because I'm, you know, I have regrets from, I'm 41, I have regrets from 30 years ago and I still have <laughs> regrets now. Um, and that's not stuff you were writing about in the 90s, right? So for me, you know, as a, br a broader audience, mm -hmm. I see that you're probably catching more people with the way that you're writing now. And again, like I said, the composition is, um, is awesome. I still see alternative, kind of alternative rock in there, but I see it's almost like uh, some of the songs too have a bit of classical music thrown in there. I mean, that's what I hear with when you're incorporating pianos and stuff too but your average yeah. person listens to it won't think that deeply into the music they just kind of oh this is catchy and you know the, the lyrics are cool um but the lyrics have meaning and the composition also has feeling right so yeah what what are your biggest regrets over the last 30 years any none <laughs> i mean gosh um I mean, you know, I mean, I've made some bad choices, certainly, but I, I guess, uh, you know, but I'd like where I am. So, you know, I, I, I fear that if I were to have changed those things or chosen to do something different at that time, then I may not be where I am right now. Yeah. And to me, it looks like you're in a, you're in a good place. Uh, you, uh, what I've seen out of the last couple of years, even right now, I'm kind of excited to hear about what are we to expect on some of the new the new album coming out. I mean, I know you don't have to talk in depth about it to give away stuff, but is there anything um, that we can look forward to with that? 
Well, I hope you can look forward to it. I mean, I, I think <laughs> it's, it's it's probably going to be a little heavier than the last album, and um, and you know, I would really like. And I think the last album that I did too, I played a majority of the instruments, so um, which is cool because I can I can do that. But um, but on the other end of it, there's something about having that interaction with other human beings. So. Um, I, I think I kind of did that more out of convenience, but but this time, and I've been touring with these these uh, same three or four guys off and on for the past few years, and so I'd really like to use them more on this next album. So I think you'll have a little more of that that kind of energy that, that comes from multiple people, human beings playing together. Um, you know, a little heavier, and but you know, other than that, it's you know, there'll be the same kind of life challenges i mean i still have plenty of challenges you know i mean but uh i think i've just you know i've got a fantastic relationship with my wife and and a good relationship with my kids and you know i, I think a lot of my life is learning how to not take so much of it so seriously so seriously yeah you know I mean? <laughs> it's like yeah i mean I, there were days i mean back in the day i used to live and die by how good things were in that moment and and because you're always thinking about how something's going to be you're never appreciating where you're at in that moment or what you might have just done that was great and so um i'm getting better at that well and that's the thing is thinking outside of the box being mindfulness is what you know i've had to do because yeah it was always about today and my wife used to always have to tell me you can't you can't worry about things that happened in the past 10 years ago and you can't worry about what if tomorrow like that's just it's yeah. killing it's killing you it's stressing you out you're right. it's making you a person that you weren't and that is some of the changes that i made now some of the things that you just said you said about changes and stuff that is what i appreciate appreciate about you as a musician is you said your stuff is a little more harder or a little more <laughs> edge with the new album yeah i have appreciation for you because you're not pumping out the same you know, songs over and over and over and over again on every album. Like some bands, it's just like after the third time, it's like all sounds the same. Right. So I I heard, I heard your stripped down music because I have appreciation for artists who can take any one. I mean, most of the stuff they write should start acoustically. Like, I mean, because, and then you, you build from there, but any artist that can take their songs and perform it to the nines acoustically tells me how gifted they are as a musician. Right. So I appreciated some of your stuff, obviously, in the 90s, but then it, it changed through the 2000s. Your, your solo albums, uh, even again, like I said, you had piano and stuff. Right. Mm-hmm. And, yeah. and, then, and then now you're harder. Right. So for me, I'm not expecting, you know, are we, are we going to hear the same stuff from him over and over again? You're changing it up. I, I've lost, I wouldn't say respect, but I just interest in some artists because it just got bland after a while. Yeah. And, I mean, for you, I have kudos for that, that you're changing it up. Now, I guess you're probably doing it based on your life too, right? I mean, you pick up, you're an honest musician, so you're writing on how you feel. Like, I mean, how you started writing the material for this album now probably was different from when this pandemic started and everything else started because your mood and your thought train and your mental state is in a different place because now you're canceled shows. So now, like I said, I expect something following up this, this album that was planned to be yeah. even more different, right? Because you're yeah. going to have a tidbit or two there. So, yeah. yeah. I, mean, um, I, I hope it will be better. It should be better. Because like you said too, I'll have more time to work on the songs. By default, I've, I'm going to have more time to spend being creative. So, so, who who are your influences as like growing up? Like, let's go before you made it into your first band. Like when you were getting into music, what were you influenced by? Like, what were your musical tastes? Like, do you remember? Yeah, I mean, my musical tastes were really what my father would play in the house. Um, who was you know hardcore, you know, deep into good singer songwriters and and good song craft and, and of all different genres so you know whether it was the Beatles or Queen or the Eagles or Neil Diamond or Cat Stevens or you know it was you know Dave Brubeck I mean you never knew what was going to come out and and, uh, we'd hang out and talk about stuff in in detail so that's that's really where you know I kind of grew up listening to that stuff I think it wired my brain that way um you know and then I you know I think as a kid you, you do get into a lot of things like Rush and all this 
other stuff you, that's you, going on. And, you just brought up a Canadian band. <laughs> yeah, exactly right. I did. Yeah, I did. Yeah. So fantastic Canadian band. And, yeah. Um, and yeah, so it's like, you know, and then that, that's cool. And, and you start to just really, you're, I think as in your youth, as a songwriter, you're collecting all of these ideas and colors and genres and vibes and things that is a great way to then, as you find your own voice in songwriting, you're kind of matching a lot of these things together. Yeah, it's, it's funny you're bringing that up because like when I was a child, I my parents, you know, they're in their 70s now. So they would drive around and listen to the oldies in the car. So I got that part, you know, like I said, whether it's Fats Domino or, or uh, you know, some of those, you know, a big bopper, right? So yeah, I, I yeah, didn't yeah, get, I didn't, <laughs> yeah, I didn't get the 70s. You know, I was born in 79, right? So yeah. 91, 92, like you guys destroyed me as a child. <laughs> like meaning, that meaning, you know, it was Nirvana for me yeah. right out of the gate. Nirvana, yeah, yeah. Nirvana, 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 Nirvana for, for two or three yeah. years. Uh, you know, then you got, you know, Pumpkins, Pearl Jam, you know, Dishwalla. I mean, uh, Tonic, uh, the, the list goes on. It's all, it's a, to me, it was like underground music is what I called it. The grunge yeah. kind of post grunge. Um, yeah. And, and I was really just hell bent on that music and I, because I loved it. And at that time, you know, I was going through my teen years into my twenties and that's, that was it. Well, all of a sudden somewhere around like late twenties to 30, it just went for me and it was like uh, yeah. I, was, I was like that stuff's just too loud for me <laughs> right so <laughs> so and i mean i'm born hearing impaired so i i don't hear things the same as i was hearing able people but uh, but and all of a sudden i hit what you were just talking about like i got a little more into pink floyd i got a little more uh into zeppelin i looked uh right. you know what i had more appreciation for queen after I saw Bohemian Rhapsody, I mean, I always knew Queen, but I mean, once, because they were involved in the making of that movie, I know some of it's kind of fluff, like every movie, but when you heard the song, I'm like, damn, they had that song, damn, they had that song, damn, like, right, and, yeah. then, and then you realize they all wrote hit, hit songs, it wasn't just like Freddie wrote everything, it was right. Brian May, Deacon, they all wrote in their songs, like, individually, and then came together, and I'm like, wow, that is talent, right, like, yeah crazy but that influence to me um really broadened my horizons and honestly your music that you did the last four or five years i'm able to listen to that because i stumbled into the influences that you were just talking about you growing up because had i still had the the grunge 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 need to have that three three four chord you know power chord and, yeah. and yelling and screaming i wouldn't appreciate your later stuff individual soul yeah. stuff right so so it's kind of unique how influences from you know like you said your childhood it comes to me in my 20s now and now i can appreciate what you're doing now do you remember your first concert you ever went to or no um, not, not as an artist as a, as a yeah as a just <laughs> yeah i mean i went to see the b-52s oh geez yeah i forgot um, about them yeah, yeah. the love so shack I, and, and yeah, yeah. Say, yeah i mean this is like back in and you know um Late seventies, uh, they were around rock, late seventies. Rock, rock Lobster days and stuff like that. I was young, so it was yeah, be late seventies, early eighties, I think. B fifty twos, wow. Were they but that very California, you know, band? What well, see, and that's where you're from too. And I, I, mm -hmm. I thought originally because I, you know, until I had to go back again, I, I thought you were a Northern States guy, and then I re reviewed him like, oh, he was from California, like. A lot of stuff, a lot of stuff during your time coming out of that area was just is unreal. Like, I mean, you know, yourself, uh, Chili Peppers, I think are out of there, uh, mm -hmm. you know, whether it's uh, Everclear, like just tons, tons of music coming out of that area. Is it still, yeah. is it still prevalent there today? Like, I mean, I look at California, uh, 80s, 90s, and then it went, you know, Seattle, right? But I mean, is it yeah. still, is it still a place? Is it still happening it, there? Music it is. Uh, you know, there's just a lot of music musical people, um, bohemian kind of vibe around there that I think is good for creativity. You do have a lot of people that, that, that are in the entertainment industry that live in Santa Barbara because they're just, just north of Los Angeles. So, uh, you know, there's just a lot of that influence rolling around and then therefore there's opportunity because I think that's a big part of it is having the ability to have a place to play and to, you know, create a, a community where you can go and do stuff like that. I mean, when we were 
coming out. It was also us and Toad the Wet Sprocket from Santa Barbara. Yeah, as well. yeah, yeah. U- Ugly Kid Joe had just oh. kind of happened, and they are from yes. Santa Barbara as well. And then there were a bunch of other bands that um, Summer Camp, who was actually signed to Matador, which you know, which is Madonna's label at one point, and they they had a hit. And there were a bunch of other little bands that are little bands. There were a bunch of other bands that were doing well on different at different levels. Um, so yeah, it just seemed like there was music going on everywhere. It's crazy. Yeah, I, I spoke to um, in the beginning of the week Adam Paskowitz, um, who obviously was with the Flies, right? That uh, he's you know he sold everything off that he had, and he's trucking around the world on the ocean now uh, with his family. But he talked about the culture because uh, he's from that area, and it's it's like there's a lot of surfing involved there with some of those mm-hmm. artists. And I said, wow, like it's, you know, my appreciation for that area, it's really started with like the beach boys with yeah. the music, the surf scene. Um, and, and now it's funny because some of the bands coming out now, um, you know, I wouldn't say they care, but I mean, I've seen some bands that are pulling off, you know, three piece har- like harmony singing and stuff. And yeah. I, I look back to the Beach Boys days because there was a lot of harmony involved there. But that surf culture had to do a lot there as well, right? With life. I mean, with a lot of artists, um, it's all about, I guess, more you're, you're talking Santa Monica or those type, Huntington Beach. But but uh, did that have any impact in you growing up just in general? Or no, that was just a, you grew up there and you were used to it? Or was there a big impact for you there? I, I think, I mean, I, I, yeah, I love growing up in that area and, you know, I mean, I, I probably wasn't at the beach as much as a lot of my friends because I was, you know, I'd be practicing piano or guitar or singing or something, but, uh, you know, I, but I surf and snowboard and that is, you know, a big part of you doing one or the other, you know, um, and I think many, mostly musicians were, you know, were sporty guys too. Well, that's, that, that's why this show if you see, I mean, that's my son's uh, over there is a one third scale fender. And that was his, his guitar. It's just a one third that he was learning when he was seven years old started, but then, you know, the jerseys as well, because you just brought it up about sports. We don't have to ch- chat hockey because you, you brought that up with your first email when you said, oh, you know, I don't know much about hockey, but <laughs> the reason why I did my show that way was because yeah. the cultural influencer side of it is one thing, but musicians, and athletes because what some musicians um, don't realize is that they influence a lot of pro athletes. Or, I mean, warm ups, a walk up song when they're walking up the home plate. Um, yeah. But a lot of musicians also do realize that. And a lot of musicians are actually sports fans. So it, it kind of mm-hmm. meshes together, which is it's unique because back in the day when I grew up, I was kind of caught in a cross web. I was, uh, First, I was a really good hockey player and I was a cross country runner. And, you know, because of my hearing impairment, that's where I went. I went with sports that's because kids right. picked on me the way I talk. I couldn't hear that well. So I did athletes and exce- or athletics and excelled to fit in. But then all of a sudden around high school, I met my friend who his dad, uh, like I said, he played uh, music with the band, like the band, right? Rick, Richard Danko, those guys yep. from the 70s. Yeah. So he was a musical guy. So all of a sudden I was caught with athletics, but then I went over with the guys rocking out, you know, after high school in the drama room, cranking up the amps and then we're downtown skateboarding and causing mischief. Right. So, so, so I was, I was a guy that wanted to be friends with everybody. And, and the, the common theme was everybody loves music. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Right. So, Anyway, so I will ask you a couple more questions and I'll let you go because it's almost been an hour. It, it does fly by. But what, what do you miss the most right now about touring or, or what places, like did you have your heart set on certain venues that you were going to go to that you love? And, and I guess the second part is, is where is your most favorite place to play that you've ever played at and why? Um, right. All good questions. Well, I was supposed to be in Southeast Asia this year, so I was really excited about that because I would have been going to places I've never had a chance to go to before. I did a, a short promo tour last year where I was in uh, uh, Malaysia and um, Singapore, so kind of doing some promo, but I was supposed to go through Indonesia, um, Philippines, and then Australia and New Zealand. So as well as going back to Malaysia and, and, and to such and Singapore. So yeah, man, I, I've, there's some great venues 
in those countries and fans that are just absolutely so excited and pumped that you're there, which is so much what it's about, man, is, is, you know, when you walk into that room and there's just all that incredible energy because everybody's really excited and people know the songs and, you know, it's, it's just very... It, it, Asian fans and, tend to be that way, do they not? Like, I don't know. I've never yeah. been there, but I've seen, you know, you see concerts or footage of concerts and, and yeah. it's really weird because when I see the culture and either their clothing or their gadgets they have or, or the technology. And I lived in Belgium for a few years, um, okay. played hockey there and Holland and stuff. And I traveled to the UK a lot. So back then, you know, they were a few years ahead of us in technology and, and in Canada in the late night or mid to late nineties, but their music, it was either one way or another in that area where I was, it was either yeah. every time I walked into a bar, it was uh, cuts like a knife summer of 69 or I love rock and roll, or <laughs> it was, it was, it was a uh, house or rave music, right? In yeah, Europe in yeah. that area. So the only real rock I really saw or heard of was in uh, Pinkle Pop or some of those festivals that they had, you had, sure. but it was a combination of rock grunge or house music like DJs. So that was Europe. Is Asia that way? Or they, to me, they seem to like, they rocked out to Rush. They rock out to oh, uh, a Green yeah. Day. They rock yeah. out to, like they love, it seems like they love it. The they just song. love music. Yeah. <laughs> they just yeah. really love music. I mean, it might vary a little bit from country to country, but for the most part, they're, you know, they just love people performing. And I mean, you get into a culture like, you know, the Filipinos love to sing and they sing brilliantly, you know, it's just right. incredible. I, was, I played um, down in Peru last year um, and it's the first time I've ever played to a few thousand people and I, and every single person in the room is singing and they, you know, this is their second language, English too, right? And they know every single word to every single song. It's almost like I, I kind of forget what I'm doing in that moment. I'm up on stage and it's just staring at the other guys, the band going, this is just unbelievable, you know? And we just had done a couple months in the States where they were, you know, great shows and a lot of fun, but on a whole different level, man. Is, is, it, is, it, st is it really um, restricted in some countries though over there? Like, uh, like an Asian country? Like I heard some countries it's like, you you couldn't play this or you couldn't play that or can't say like that was with some bands or some bands supposedly were blocked from coming there i don't yeah, know well i would imagine i mean it depends because you know you you have to deal with the the country's politics and and often in terms of how conservative or liberal the country might be um religiously yeah um and you know because i know like playing in malaysia i had to be conscious because that's a muslim country even though it's extremely modern and doesn't, you know, what doesn't think of what maybe a Westerner might think of a Muslim company, a country, but they do have, you know, very strict rules in terms of what, you know, tattoos and, you know, oh, really, things right? like that and, and things that you might say. And, and so I, I, I mean, the very first show I played there was at a hard rock in uh, um, Kuala Lumpur and, and or Kuala Lumpur and, uh, and anyway, so, um, and they actually sent a few people out to kind of just make sure that I wasn't making trouble. <laughs> really? You wow. know, and I got, you know, they kind of roll in and cruise through the crowd to make sure everything's okay. But uh, yeah, so, but there was, I did get a list of things that I, I, you know, you can and can't do. Well, that's what I wondered. I wondered, is like, how would you know? Or so they must have told you ahead of time that, like, is it if they have those restrictions? I mean, I, you know, everybody's got tattoos nowadays, right? Like, yeah, exactly. is, is it a thing of like, would you have to cover them up or no? Like, yeah, that, I mean, it depends on what symbols you have. I mean, because like you get into China, for example. Yeah. And that that's a big one because they're very controlling in terms of what people can and can't see. Um, and that's more of a political thing. So, but then you have other countries, yeah, where it's, you have to be conscious of, of um, yeah, of, of the same things, but for different reasons. Often it's it, religious reasons. Has it opened up more though over 20, 25 years? Like ha has, I wouldn't say restrictions or guidelines. Have you seen some looseness when you travel over there a little bit more or just well, kind, I mean, of, yeah, kind of, I, think, I don't think it's really changed. I think it's kind of, it's kind of ebbed and flowed. If anything, there might be more regulations just because there's, there's more of a, of a consciousness that perhaps we should be controlling things, you know, and you can, 
I don't know. I mean, because I've never really had to think about, you know, these things that come across my desk and it's like, oh, okay. Wow. Okay. I can't, I can't wear that. I can't say that. I can't talk about that, you know, but I've, I've had the same problem in the States though, to a degree. I mean, I, I was really? doing, we were doing some shows, Dishwalla was for uh, the, you know, Six Flags amusement parks. Yep. And we had about, I don't know, half a dozen or a dozen shows with them set up. And that was really paying for our whole tour. You know, we'd go and play for a few thousand people in the theme park. But then during the week, we'd play, you know, another five or six shows around. And that was, you know, so it was, it was a great situation. And then all of a sudden we get this letter from their corporate headquarters and said, you know, you've, you have um, gone against, breached your contract contractual obligations. Um, and so we're like, what are they talking about? What have we done? You know, what, what do they, what do they mean? And, and canceled all of our show, remaining shows. <laughs> so we're going through and we're trying to figure it out. Finally, we get to find the message it is because of, um, uh, bad language. Really? So yeah. Wow. And, and it was because I was referring to God as a woman in counting blue cars. Oh Yeah. Right. I yeah. Mean, yeah. Which really surprised me. I'm like, come on, this so, is really this. Yeah. Is, you know. Yeah. So it's, and, and and you know what? That's probably a question I can ask you now. Is well, two things. Did you really? Did you see the movie Dogma after that? Like, I mean, Alanis Morissette was God in Dogma, right? So bad. Yeah. You were you were right on, right? But I mean, right, right. but I mean, now all of a sudden, okay, you're what? So that would have been in the '90s with Six Flags with all that. So Actually, no, that was like 2000, 2000? Okay. 2003 or something like that. Okay. So crazy, huh? Like I, I don't like getting political on the show and I've always told <laughs> people that because we might agree or we might disagree, but in the end, when we agree or disagree, we should all still get along. That's the way I should, we just respect oh, it. Absolutely. But, but I'm, I'm getting to a point where when I look, especially at artists or at pro athletes, Everything you say, you do, your actions are watched and scrutinized. And the sad part is, is that now it's becoming, everybody is kind of eating each other now, meaning you come in and you support this, but if you, if it goes one more and you're, this person no longer is in the realm of being cared for, it's this person now. And it, it, like you said, one person got offended by it. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, they refer to cancel culture. Um, and really, when you wrote the song, I don't know the meaning behind the lyric. I mean, only the artist can interpret it. But, you know, I never would have been offended. I'm still not offended by it. But we're killing, in my opinion, we're killing creativity by having to be careful about what we write or pen or say, meaning on an artist's point of view, because mm -hmm. you write your next song and it definitely offends somebody, you're done. <laughs> Right? Is that a cause for concern? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Well, I mean, I, I mean, you know, it's one of those things. I, I, I don't, I, I won't regulate what I'm trying to say. No. You know, and because yeah, you're right. It's, it's. I mean, people should be able to, to say what they, how they feel. And there's certainly no malice in any. You know, it'd be one thing if I was, you know, threatening to kill somebody. But you know, like how many urban, you know, guys do that these days. But. It's just one of those things, and, and any venue has an absolute right to decide who they basically oh, yeah. play there. I I have no objection to that, and that's completely within their rights. It's just I guess I'm just more surprised than anything. You know, so so the, halfway in it. <laughs> was that complaint? Was the complaint basically based on the line when you were singing it? Like it just that's what it was? Or yeah, uh, it's it's like, under and it's weird. It's because you know you sign these contracts a lot of times, and and I think a lot of times. Uh, the promoters or the venues themselves will give themselves ways out. So if they decide they don't feel comfortable with something, there'll be some clause in there that they can manipulate to kind of say legally, you've, you've, you've done this. It has nothing to do with us, even though uh, <laughs> nothing had changed on our side. So, um, you know, which is just part of the whole business thing. The sad part is that line, like, I mean, it's still, to me, it's probably one of the most brilliant lines in the song. Like, I mean, it's unique, right? Like to me, when yeah. I, uh, ah, there's a different way of thinking, right? Like you're just meaning, you know, cause you always hear that even when it's either religious people or not religious people or someone makes an off the cuff comment about, you know, you know, God, and maybe it might be Muslim or it might be this, or it might be a girl or it might be, but right. just the way you hear that song, it just kind of flowed. Right. And it was kind of just 
unique. And then when you look at the, uh, you know, artwork surrounding album covers, it's the same type of thing. It's all about creativity yeah. and making, pe making people think like, you know, right. No, right? No. Well, that, so, that's the whole point. Art is supposed to make you think. And yeah. you know, sometimes a negative reaction is still a, a reaction and it's making people think, which is all good. Oh, it's, n it's not the same as, you know, band from California walking out and just wearing socks on their, uh, <laughs> Right. I mean, I mean, yeah. I mean, back then it was outraged today. It's fine. <laughs> right? right. I mean, I mean, I don't, whatever the the flavor of the day is, I guess. I mean, it's, right, a, right. it's always going to change. I mean, you go back to Elvis Presley shaking the right. heads. We're going to film them from above the waist because yeah, it's, yeah, it's, yeah, exactly. it's devil's music. Right. Right. Yeah. So, so anyways, uh, so Jerry, yeah, I, I appreciate the conversation. Uh, yeah. it's, it's been about an hour, but what I just want to ask you so that yeah. I can, uh, have people see this, listen to it, and, uh, maybe I can post it. Um, where do you have, do you have any Patreon page for yourself or are you strictly just Spotify anywhere that I can send people for, uh, you know, any charities you're doing or just your music or anything that you'd like me to tag in the podcast. I want to make sure people are going there and are supporting you. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I do have a, a, like a Patreon type of thing for myself. Um, but it's through, um, a, uh, an organization called Band Bandcamp, so they have like a subscriber service there, and I, I just call it the Green Room. Okay. So Green Room VIP. So I, I can I can send you the the link to that. Yep. Send me the link, and and of course I'll post some links to uh, your website as well as uh, anything on Spotify for you in the music apps because yeah, uh, really. like I said, you got you're gonna have a new album coming out at some point. So mm -hmm. I want people to really uh, go back and, and explore the last couple of years because I think it's pretty cool the music that's come out and I okay. I want them to to be there. And if I can uh, like I said, if I can send tidbits out on my end every now and again and once that music release, send them your way, that's uh, that's helping you out because we don't know how long this is gonna last, right? So yeah right exactly. so so anyway so i want to yeah. thank i want to thank you for jumping on i i uh, wasn't going to ask the hockey questions to you um but i want to wish you and your family all the the, the health and, and safety and um you know i wish you best of luck moving forward and i appreciate you coming on awesome man well thank you chris man thanks so much for having me man it's been a pleasure will do take care eh? all right